it's pitch black, you can't see a thing. I'm on a conveyor belt and everybody on the conveyor belt has lung cancer. And one of the time I hear them dropping off, dropping off. And that's how I wake up all the time. I don't know if I'm next or not. In 2004, Ed Levitt was at the airport heading out of town on a business trip when he felt an unusual pain in his right leg. Three days later at the hotel, it took me 45 minutes to put my pants on. The pain was so bad. Within a week, Levitt had developed a hard lump in his leg and he went to see an oncologist. After a biopsy, he received the same devastating diagnosis that's given to over 200,000 Americans every year, lung cancer. The disease had already spread throughout his body meaning he had just months to live. All of a sudden, I realized how important he was to me and how difficult my life would be without him. And that was really hard to deal with. And we always said, well, when we retire, we're gonna do all of these things. And then he gets diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so you don't think you're gonna get to do anything. Given his prognosis, Ed Levitt's best hope was to avoid spending his final days in agony. It was his nurse who recommended an experimental drug called Erisa that might ease his pain. He started taking the drug, and within days, his tumors had disappeared. And within a matter of a month, he was back to normal. What is Erisa? Yeah. Erisa's magic. You want to know? It's magic. <laughs> Actually, I think it's a brown aspirin, if you want the truth. I don't know what it is. Erisa worked so well on Ed Levitt's cancer because he has a genetic mutation affecting what's called the epidermal growth factor receptor in his cells. Levitt is one of a kind in that sense, but scientists have come to accept that many cancer patients and their tumors are unique. For years and years, the research was focused on trying to find the big cure, but there is no one treatment that's going to work for all of them, and they pretty much know that now. But the FDA withdrew this life-saving drug from the market. Those who had been taking it already, like Levitt, would be allowed to continue, but no new patients could start. Why would the FDA do such a thing? Because it's in the business of approving what's safe and effective for the typical or average patient. The problem is that we aren't wholesale. I'm not wholesale and neither are you. Peter Huber is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and author of The Cure in the Code, How 20th Century Law is Undermining 21st Century Medicine. He's also a member of the Institute's Project FDA, a group of scientists, policy experts, and economists that promotes reforming the Food and Drug Administration to meet the challenges of the new age of personalized medicine. All of the evidence we're getting now is that our bodies tend to vary a whole lot. And then you get drugs that are good for some patients and not good for others. And then that's where we run into a collision with the FDA, and the FDA is a major problem. Huber says FDA trials need to become adaptive, constantly taking in new information along the way. If you assume at the outset the diseases are not simple, so when we begin prescribing a drug, we don't count on 95% of the people stand up and, and are in great shape. We're looking for pieces. If the initial results show that a drug is helping just one out of 10 patients, rather than declare it a failure, scientists need to look at what it is about that one patient that's different. And then you can begin saying, all right, look, we, we're not sure about this, but we've got a hypothesis. It's this marker or that marker or the next one. So the trial would change course, perhaps bring in patients who are more likely to benefit from treatment or adding additional drugs to the mix to build better combination therapies. There are powerful statistical tools for, for choreographing trials that explore multiple avenues, you know, including several drugs at the same time, moving in some types of patients, moving others, and get rigorous statistical results, okay? And then you converge very quickly on a set of patient selection criteria that sort of fit the patient to the drug, if you will, and then you get spectacular results and we should be using them. Convincing the FDA to change protocols that have been in place for decades is no easy task. Sooner or later we're all going to be patients and the public has to understand that the science is available, the techniques are available, and the FDA simply has to adapt its mode of operation to those new realities. The Manhattan Institute in this project is trying to lead the way in letting them know what their stake is in this issue. 
but change is afoot whether the FDA likes it or not. Empowered by new information about their own bodies, patients are taking control of their medical destinies. Right now, there are means for people to know what their genetic makeup is. They're going to get that information. And when they get that information, they and their doctors are going to be able to find techniques to make their lives better. People empowered with their own information, they won't take no for an answer. It's a pure motivation. It's about a person and their health. and. It's one thing when it's a, a person in their own genetic information, but when it's a parent and maybe it's their child who is sick, watch out. John Crowley is an extreme example of a parent who wouldn't be told no. He has two children born with a rare and fatal neuromuscular disorder. Aware of promising research in the field and frustrated with the slow pace of development, he started his own biotech company and helped bring to market a treatment that saved the lives of his children. There are some diseases that literally if we don't advance medical research, people will not only suffer, they will die. So we know the outcome. So if we get away from a pure safety and efficacy standpoint in a, some vacuum and actually look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. We can help to advance regulatory science to catch up with what really is an, an amazingly exciting time in medical science. Both Crowley and Peter Huber point to the AIDS crisis as a model for how extraordinary activism by individuals can force change at the FDA. Those of us who are old enough to remember this, remember there's just a palpable sense of fear. This was a serious epidemic. It was clearly lethal once it, it matured. There was a, a sort of a convergence of people saying, we're going to beat this, and, and that made a huge difference. AIDS advocates even got the FDA to do the impossible approved the use of a drug called thalidomide that had provided the justification for modern drug regulation in the 1960s. When taken by pregnant women in Europe, thalidomide was found to cause death and deformity to their unborn fetuses. In the US, however, the FDA had kept the drug off the market, a move widely cited as proof of the need for stringent new regulations. But the case of thalidomide also demonstrated the downside of blanket policies that treat all patients the same. Years later, AIDS patients found that thalidomide cleared up many of the painful skin lesions associated with the virus. So they begged some companies, won't you please go and develop thalidomide domestically and begin trying to get it licensed? What most companies said, you must be stark raving mad, you know? I mean, we saw what happened last time, you know? So they began smuggling it in and they just said, we dare you. I mean, for a lot of them, the ones who knew, who knew they were HIV positive, their lives were at stake and they were, you know, young and active and smart and determined enough to, to go fight it. In the space of 10 years, we reformed enough of the regulatory system to get it right. Drug companies poured in, they beat that virus one bloody molecule at a time from different sides, you know, and we can do it again and again and again. We die! We die! We die! So the, the lesson there, I think, is the importance of activism, not to get one drug approved, but to bring to the forefront a patient viewpoint and to help regulators understand oftentimes the risk that they're willing to take when there is no alternative. The bright future, it sounds strange, but we, we pick off very complex diseases, one disease at a time. It will rarely be a single drug and it will rarely be a very simple prescription protocol. But given the time and the money and the effort, I think we can cure the vast majority of them. Ten years after receiving what amounted to a death sentence, Ed Levitt is still in almost perfect health. Having gotten to know many other lung cancer patients personally, he's painfully aware of how lucky he is and how many other people could still be helped. They all come back and they all die. It's very depressing when there's no one left. I feel like Custer of the little bighorn. And like I look around, damn, they're all dead, just me. You know, and I'm waiting for that last arrow to come. And people want to know why I get angry. Why I get scared, why I'm scared all the time, why I have nightmares. It's because there's a facade out there. I'm sorry, the FDA could be so great, but it chooses not to be. Help these people.